You are watching Call for Two. I'm Jesse Reichler, and today I'm continuing my playthrough of the Legacy of Dragonholt, which is basically a souped-up choose-your-own-adventure book. Um, this is episode two. We don't know what chapter we're going to be playing, unless actually it's occurred to me now. So on our first playthrough, we played to New Roads. It just says approximate play time 50 to 80 minutes. Took us about 80 minutes, I think. And we finished this quest, and it's done. We won't visit it again. And we ended up at Dragonholt Village. This book says something different than the others. It says approximate play time 30 to 50 minutes per chapter. And it's the one big giant book. So I guess we may be returning here multiple times and playing this, reading from this multiple times between quests. And each quest may, uh, uh, each intermission may be 30 to 50 minutes. And I'm not sure uh, the way I did it last time was I stopped when we got to Dragonholt Village. It seems like a natural place to stop. But I'm not sure if story-wise it would would be better to read this as part of that gameplay session. But for now, we're going to keep it up. We've got two trinkets. We've got a wooden trinket with a heart and T and a U. We've got three healing potions, which we've recorded here, that we've got three healing potions here. We're down to 10 stamina, but we can heal up plus six health, plus seven health each time. I think I may have given myself... Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, and we've marked off certain story points that we've activated. And where we left our quest, we just made it into Dragonholt Village. We met... We brought Mariam back. We brought Mariam back with Braxton, her friend. And we got to the inn, the Swan Inn, where Miriam's mother, not mother, uh, aunt or something. So let's read 1001, where we're supposed to continue off. You wake to the smell of freshly baked bread and the chipper voices of Miriam and Sapphire. Sapphire, that's the woman who runs the inn. Golden shafts of sunlight stream through the window beside your bed, and you idle for a moment before getting up, watching the dust float in the air and in the morning light. With a yawn and a stretch, you rise, you rise from your bed and prepare yourself for the day ahead. As you step out of your room, you see that Braxton has also just stepped into the corridor. She gives you a polite smile and nod. Morning. You are just about to respond when Miriam comes around the corner from the direction of the common room. Good, you're awake. Breakfast is ready. It's a real feast, exclaims Miriam eagerly. Come on, it'll get cold if you just dawdle in the hall. With that, Miriam takes Braxton's hand and drags her, while Braxton allows herself to be dragged, toward the common room. Read entry 10042. So actually... Dragonholt. I think we're done with to new roads. Dragonholt has its own tracking sheet, which will be a copy of what we see here at the back of the book to keep track of what's. It looks like what is it keeping track? It's keeping track of time passing on these eight, seven days. And then some various progress tracks. Interesting. Okay, so we've got that here on this sheet. And we've also got... I'm going to separate this. Okay. And then we've got Dragonholt Village way of tracking our entries. So we started out at 1001. And we're told to read 1042. So let's read that. 
You descend the stairs to the sunken common room. Sapphire is setting a table with plates. Miriam uses Miriam ushers Braxton to the table and they both sit. You take a seat and examine the feast that Sapphire has prepared. Large yellow eggs, thick slices of brown toast, juicy ham steaks, and seasoned pan-fried potatoes. As you are scooping food onto your plate, Sapphire returns with two large pitchers, one filled with creamy milk and the other with freshly squeezed juice. After checking on the other patrons, Sapphire returns and sits at the table with you. So what brings you to Dragonholt? Have you come in search of love? Or... Sapphire gasps and glances around before leaning in close. Are you here for revenge? Braxton coughs and strikes her chest with a fist, having choked on a bit of potato, and Miriam begins laughing. The love of Beatrix runs in the family, I see, mutters Braxton after a drink of milk. Sapphire blushes lightly and looks back at you. Forgive me, perhaps I gossip with the neighbors a bit too much. So we can tell her that we're visiting an old friend, just looking for the next adventure, hoping to find gainful employment. If I'm lucky, I'm not the only one searching for love. Requires empathy, which we don't have. I seek vengeance on the man who killed my father. Well, we're orphans, so that might be the one for us, but it requires deception or performance. I think maybe she's making a joke. So we can't do these two. Uh, I guess we're going for the next adventure. Five, five, eight, six. Let's write that down. Five, five. Oh, you may have come to the wrong village in search of adventure, dear, says Sapphire. Dragonholt is a pretty sleepy little village, a place to retire from adventures, it seems. Eventide Forest is the most adventurous thing about the area, if you ask me. But even that's just big, dark forest when you take a closer look. Sapphire winks at you before continuing. That said, we do have our share of folklore. Miriam might have told you this one already, but apparently some hero type was buried in a crypt to the north. They say he wielded powerful magic and even defeated dragons. It's pretty far-fetched, but it's a nice tale for the children, at least. Mark, story point B5. Okay. B5. All right. The bells on the front door jingle, signaling someone entering the inn. Sapphire stands. Excuse me, she says, and hurries off to welcome the new patron. Read 2994. Okay, 2994. After breakfast, you return to your room and grab what you'll need before venturing into the village for the day. When you return to the common room, you see that Braxton is also about to set out. Many of the patrons have dispersed since breakfast, but a few remain in the common room, reading or mingling with one another. Miriam is nowhere to be seen. If you have any questions about Dragonholt, don't hesitate to ask me, says Sapphire. Where has Miriam gone off to? asks Braxton. Oh, that child couldn't wait any longer and ran off to see the old apothecary's shop. Sapphire shakes her head. Even if she buys it, It'll be some time before it's up and running. Nasty fire it was. Lorimore fire is nothing to take lightly. If you discovered the hidden message in the letters from Solis, read entry 1518. Otherwise, read 55302. So, that brings us to the, the hidden letter, which I did take a look at. Before I started here, um, but I did not figure it out. So the person says when we when we read the 
book. In fact, let me start. Let me see if I can find it here. When we read the letter from Solis, it says, You have always known Solis to be excessively proper in her speaking. She must have been in a panic while writing to have produced so many spelling errors. Even more alarming is the brief note on the back of the letter. You had not received any word from Solis before this one. Could she have sent another letter that was intercepted as she had feared? Um, although you are sure the letter was written in her hand, the message contains several details that you find uncharacteristic of the elf you had ventured with in the past. You had never known her to drink dwarven wine, and you would swear she always wore a green cloak. So the way the message is written makes you feel there is more to the letter than is obvious. So if you look at the letter, here, 2994 is where we are. If you look at the letter, there's lots of spelling errors. She said she never drank dwarven wine. And her favorite cloak was green. And then the message here is, please refer to my first letter. And we don't have any other letters. So I was thinking maybe the first letter is the M. First letter. But... Um, or it could be the first letter of each column. That doesn't work. France M I I A H E Q. No. I wrote down all the misspellings, but that did not help. I mean, it didn't give me anything. There's two kinds of misspellings. There's some. Most of them are letter reversals, like taken is spelled T-A-E-K-N instead of T-A-K-E-N. So I wrote all those down. That still didn't really help. I, mean, I can't find a, I can't find a message in here. And then she said she never drank dwarven wine. And her coat was green instead of blue. Not blue. Like if you take a collection of all the misspelled words, they don't really spell anything. If I try to look at the letters in the misspelled words, that doesn't really spell anything. Please refer to my first letter. So the first letter could be my first letter. That would be a C. Or first letter of the letter could be an M. My first letter, I would guess, might be a C. But how does that, how would that help us?
I dare not say more openly, as I think it's likely this message will be intercepted. There's words with extra letters, like L's spelled with two L's, intercepted spelled with two R's. And if I collect all those letters, I still don't get anything interesting. Get that hint again. Never known her to drink dwarven wine. You would swear she always wore a green cloak. Too many spelling errors. Brief note at the back of the thing. Please refer to my first letter. My first letter, that sure seems like that would be a C. How does that help us? First letter is a C. It's where there are different kinds of spelling errors, like here is I pray spelled wrong, P-R-E-Y instead of P-R-A-Y. And then this one, the letters are reversed. Letters are reversed. Reversed. Extra letter. Okay, I don't know.
I don't know how to make sense of it. So we will choose the option that says we don't know how to make sense of it. If you discovered the secret message, read this. Otherwise, read 5302. So we're going to read 5302 and have it explained to us, I assume. It's a little disappointing. Thank you for your hospitality, Sapphire, says Braxton as she opens the door to leave. Of course, hon, replies Sapphire. Good luck with the guards. Braxton smiles and nods before leaving. You are about to leave yourself when Sapphire stops. You almost forgot. If, you, if you're going around Dragonholt without a map, you might get lost. It's a small village, but some of the alleyways are a real labyrinth. She produces a folded piece of parchment and lays it out on the counter. Let's see. She mutters and scans the map. Ah, here we are. She marks a spot on the mar map with the swan. She sends... Spends a moment marking numerous other locations for convenience. Here you are. Don't lose it now, she says as she folds up the map and hands it to you. If you have any other questions about Dragonholt, come back and ask me. You gain the map of Dragonholt. This encounter is complete. So here's our map of Dragonholt. There's the swan where we were. I guess when we had our option to say we were visiting an old friend, it didn't occur to me that probably, maybe we should have said that. Okay. Uh, this encounter is complete. Now it says map of Dragonhold. After completing an encounter, use the map of Dragonhold to choose a new location to visit. Each location has a four-digit number that corresponds to an entry in the book. When you choose a location, read the corresponding entry in this book. If playing with two or more players, you will each take turns choosing a location to visit. During your time in Dragonhold, you might wish to gather information about the village or country or the events that happen within. Returning to the Swan to speak with Sapphire or visiting the village hall are great ways to gather such information. In addition, you might try visiting the local taverns in search of rumors. The encounters in this book take place over multiple days as tracked on the tracking sheet on the back cover of this book. At the end of each day, an effect on the tracking sheet will instruct you to read a specific entry that bridges the gap between the day that just ended and the next day in the story. The events that occur at each location might change from day to day, and special events might occur on specific days. However, some locations will have the same or similar events on multiple days. You cannot gain the benefits of any single entry more than once each day. So we finished with our little encounter at the Swan. But we can go back there now. Anytime we want. We can go to any of these places. So we could go to the apothecary and visit Miriam. Um, so Lise, did she tell us where she was working? She's taken a position as a tutor in the house of Lady Regina Fairfax, Countess of Dragonholt, just outside the village. All right, well, there's the dragon. So this is where we came in through the dragon statue. And there's going to be Lady Fairfax Manor just outside the village. So maybe we should start off by going there. I think that makes sense. Let's do it. Let's go to 1400 and see what's going on with Solis. Although, it makes you wonder if we should... Um, solve that letter first. The wooden trinket has the letters T and U. Any T and U here? No, I guess we have to find those people. I mean, let's get down to business. Let's go visit Fairfax Manor, 1400. The 
The manor house is a sprawling structure of gray stone, its facade covered with dark green ivy. The east wing of the manor is older than the rest, its tall, narrow windows doubling as arrow slits, and its roof marked by, cancel by crenellations. An arching stair leads to the main door on the ground floor. If four or less time has passed today, read the entry below that corresponds to the current day. Otherwise, not accepting visitors. So four or less time has passed. Um, do we need, did a day pass at the end of that day? It just says the encounter is complete. The encounters in this book take, take place over multiple days. At the end of each day, an effect will tell you. Hmm. All right, well, nothing's telling us, so we're still on day one, I guess. The tracking sheet says, when, e when eight time has passed in day one, read this thing. All right, so no time has passed. For less time, read the entry below that corresponds to the current day. All right, so we're in day one, so we're going to read 1401 Fairfax Manor. You step into the grand hall of the manor, which is lit only by the sun shining through the high windows. A human serving girl sits at a long table, polishing silver. If story point V6 is marked, but I6 is not. Okay, so let's look at our things here. V6 is not marked. If neither S8 or V6 are marked, that's the case. No S8 or V6. Read entry 9072. 9072. The young woman sees you and calls out, Mr. Timothy. A moment later, a slender man in a slightly rumpled velvet doublet emerges from a door to your left. Ah, he says, yes, hello, I'm Timothy. Her ladyship steward. You ask after Solis, explaining that you are old friends. Terribly sorry, says Timothy. I'm afraid Solis is not available. To be honest, I haven't seen or heard from her in two days. You ask after Countess Regina, and Timothy shakes his head. No, I'm afraid the Countess is not available to visitors. She's far too busy. If story point Y5 is marked, which it is not, otherwise time passes and the encounter is complete. Okay, so time passes and the encounter is complete. Wow, okay, so our person is not there, hasn't been seen for two days, and Regina hasn't seen either but we could come back here if y5 was marked and also if we had come by and v6 was marked we'd get something else hmm. I would really like to know what that uh, I mean, Sapphire, the woman at the inn, seems like she's got lots of information. Let's go back to her and ask about if what she knows about Solis, because she does gossip. So I'm going to 7,400. So now it's interesting. The game is now letting us choose where we go rather than just following along with the story. So we've got a little bit of choice here. 7400 The Swan. The Swan is a neat, elegant building standing on a foundation of gray stone. The inn rises two stories above you, its walls shingled with blue stained wood, and its glassed in windows surrounded by whitewashed shutters. 
The obvious care that goes into the building's upkeep somehow conspires to make it seem smallish and homey, despite being one of the largest buildings in the village. Read the entry below that corresponds to the current day. All right, so we're in day one. The common room is particularly quiet. A pair of patrons are playing a game that features a circular board and several pieces of wood carved to resemble knights, dragons, or other fanciful creatures. A human woman sits in a comfortable-looking chair by the hearth, wrapped almost entirely in a blanket and reading a book. If six or more time has passed, no. Otherwise, 6971. Okay, 6971. The swan is as pleasant and homey as ever. Sapphire smiles when she sees you and waves to you from where she sits under the window sewing. So we can ask her for something to eat. We can ask about someone or something in Dragon Hole. We can ask her to craft us some magical armor. But it requires a war rune, which we don't have. Or we can go back to our room and let time pass if we want to advance time. All right, so let's ask about someone or something in Dragon Hole 2282. Let's see what you can tell us about the Countess and Solis. 2282. Well, I've lived here a few years now, says Sapphire, while Tying off a thread, I think I know Dragonholt and its residents pretty well. What do you want to know? I have a question about someone in Dragonholt, or anywhere in Dragonholt you'd recommend. What is there to do in Dragonholt? All right, let's ask someone about, so 2282 we want to come back to, so I'm going to make a little mark there. Anywhere in Dragonholt you'd recommend? No, let's go to ask about someone. 15, 14... This is to talk to Sapphire. Fifteen fourteen about someone in Dragon Hole. Quite a few characters in this village, last Sapphire. Who do you want to know about? So we can ask about Lady Regina, Sonia, Fairfax, Celise, Miriam, the Cunninghams, or about herself. If we have empathy, which we don't have. All right, let's start at the top. I'm going to mark this because this is someplace we want to keep coming back to. Ask Sapphire about people. All right, let's ask about Lady Regina Fairfax, 1779. Oh, Lady Regina, says Sapphire. She's a bit of a scandalous figure, you know. Even so, she's our, she's our scandalous figure. She wasn't meant to be Countess, you see. Her father is natural daughter, so not in line to inherit. But she was raised here and in the hills and forests. They say her mother was a wild woman, a witch of the woods, and she's never been one to follow tradition if she saw a better way. Sapphire pauses, turning her thimble idly on her thumb. It happened before I came to the village, of course, but apparently Regina did, well, something to save the entire country. I heard she cast a great spell, or that she became the bride of the forest to appease the spirits, or that she did battle with a dragon. Anyway, whatever it was, was so impressive that her father legitimized her and made her his heir. He died a few years later, and she's ruled as Countess of Dragonholt ever since, and she's been a good one, too. Read entry 6740. Okay, so Lady Regina is a good person. Six seven four zero. Oh. Sapphire holds her sewing project up to the light to examine her progress. Was there anything else you wanted to know about it, hon? I have a question about someone in Dragonhold. Oh, this is just bringing it back. We can go ask, we can go back to her and ask another about another person. We're back at 6740. It's actually not exactly where we were, but it's somewhere. Okay, so we're going to ask about someone else, which brings us back to 15, 
14. Fifteen fourteen West ask about Solis one zero zero two. Oh, first page. Oh yes, Solis comes to the Swan from time to time for lunch. Says Sapphire, a very proper woman she is, always looking quite organized. In fact, I've seen her frazzled just once. A couple days before you arrived, actually. She was going into the chatty archer with her cloak drawn around her. I almost didn't recognize her. Sapphire tilts her head to one side as if trying to remember something. It's a bit odd when I think about it. Until then, I had never seen her go into either of the taverns in the village. Can't blame her. A human brew can't stand up to elven wines. Sapphire shakes off the tangent. I haven't seen her in a while, but if you're looking for her, I would check the library or the shrine. That's where I've seen her spend most of her time when she's not at the manor. And go to 6740, which is this place again. Okay, so... She's going into the chatty archer. I'm going to have to start taking some notes here. So the Chatty Archer, I have these, I can start marking these. So she says that our person went to the Chatty Archer, but she also advised us to check the library and the shrine. There's the shrine and there's the library. And this is where she was going when she was nervous. Okay. And then it told us to go to 6740, which is where we go when we want to decide what else to ask about. All right, so I'm not going to ask about anyone else that was on that list that we have no we don't haven't heard about. What was the Let's see. Lady Regina has three children. Yeah, okay. Well, let's go to these places that um, this woman recommended. We check out if we're looking for Solis. The Shrine, the Library, and the Chetty Archer. Let's start out at the Chetty Archer where she was last seen. 6,500. So I'll move this since we're going here. An archery butt lies under a maple tree outside this rustic lodge style tavern. Several arrows are stuck within it, and others stand, down, stand point down in the earth by the tavern's polished pinewood door. A strung bow hangs over the door, nestled under the awning to protect it from the elements. If four or more time has passed, well, no time has passed so far, then do this. Otherwise, the Chetty Archer is not open until evening. The encounter is complete. Okay, so we're going to say Chetty... Archer, we want to come back, return after four time. All right, so we got to remember that. All right, let's go to the library. We need to make some little marks, don't we, to tell us to return. Uh, okay, let's go to the library, 2480. The village library is large for a village of the size of Dragonholt. It features an antechamber, a main room with rows of bookshelves, and a few side rooms. On most days, one of the side rooms is used as a classroom for the village youths. If for or less time, then we can read it, otherwise it's closed. 
Okay, so it's still daytime, so we can go to 2505. 2505. The library's main hall features a tall writing desk underneath a window set in the ceiling and four walls covered in shelves full of books. Perched atop a stool at the writing desk is a gray-robed, gray-haired human woman spattered with ink, her quill stitching, scritching as she carefully copies out another letter. If it is day one and story point V6 is not marked, which it's not, read entry 7529. So we got a mark here. This is the library. But there are other things to do here on other days. So 7529. After a moment, she places her pen aside and picks up a sander made from silver-chased horn, sprinkling a fine dusting of powdered resin to dry her ink. Then she turns to you. Welcome to Dragonholt Library, she says. Can I help? Her question trails off as she takes a look at you for the first time. She takes in your appearance and mannerisms with a critical eye for a moment before asking your name. You tell her, and she blows out a breath she may not have realized she was holding. Come this way. She dismounts her stool and leads you through a low door to a tall, narrow room lit only by windows far above you. No candles or torches here, please, she says. A fire here would mean centuries of wisdom lost. She leads you around a long bookshelf, and you find that the room was not narrow at all, only blocked off by the enormous shelf. Celise is resting comfortably in a chair with a book on her lap. Celise, says the librarian, I've brought company. Thank the spirits you are here, says Celise, springing to her feet and narrowly rescuing the book before it falls to the floor. Thank you, she says to the librarian, who nods and shuffles away, leaving you alone with Solis. Read five, six, eight, two. Wow, we found Solis. Maybe she's going to explain to us about that crazy code she used in her letter. I sure would like to know what it was. I'm glad you came, says Solis. There is trouble afoot, and I'm getting too old for trouble. Celise doesn't look a day older than when you met her, but then again, she's an elf. I believe that someone is plotting against the noble family here. You might already know that the local lord is Lady Regina Fairfax, Countess of Dragonholt. She had, up until recently, three children, Sonia, Rochelle, and Philip. Regina is sick. She seems a little young to me to be dying already, but humans will do that on you, I suppose. So her daughter Sonia was poised to inherit the country, the county. But Sonia came to me and said she had received a letter from her uncle Kirik, Regina's brother. Kirik demanded that Sonia renounce her position and support Kirik's claim to Regina's seat. Sonia refused him, of course. Days later, continues Sully, Sonia fell from her horse, struck her head on a rock, and died. Not suspicious on its own, perhaps, but Sonia is, well, was, an excellent rider. She was alone in the forest when it happened. I became concerned that Kirik had murdered her. I shared my suspicions with Timothy, Regina's steward. And that night, as I returned to my bedroom, a heavy statue in the gallery toppled over and nearly killed me. Solis closes her eyes and leans back, resting her head. So I fled. I had already sent the letter to you, so I hid in the village waiting. Mark story point V6. Okay, so that was a story point that some of our other things were asking us if we had. So V6 is Mark. So we've been told about a very important element of this game, of this story that we're marking. Celise stands, brushing down her cloak and taking a deep breath. But nothing unusual has happened since then, and Philip and Rochelle remain safe. 
It would seem the situation is not as dire as I had suspected. For now, I think it's wise for you to acquaint yourself with the villagers and gain their trust. We will need them on our side if it comes to a struggle for leadership. But right now, I will go straight to Lady Regina and tell her everything. Will you come with me? We can say, of course, Elise, let's go now. Or we could say, go on your own, I have other business to attend to, and then time passes. Hmm. Go on your own, I have other business to attend to. I guess it depends whether we want to look around the, the town a bit before we go meet up with this. I mean, I did want to go to the shrine, but we were looking for Celise and we already found her. And I did want to go visit the apothecary to see if we could talk to Miriam or maybe the guard station. I mean, we have a hundred gold, it'd be nice to buy some stuff. So, let's tell her to go. No, we better go with her just in case there's danger. Of course, let's go now. Five. Four, five, five. We've got plenty of time to explore the village later. Five, four, five, five. You go with Solis to Fairfax Manor, where a middle-aged human woman in servant's livery opens the door for you with an expression of surprise. I must speak with the Countess at once, Matilda, says Solis. Matilda only nods and ushers you upstairs, where Regina's audience chamber lies in the manor's ancient round tower. The Countess's enormous black throne is empty, but the Countess is seated on a carpet by one hearth. She is a human woman of middling years, with fair skin and enormous green eyes, almost luminescent in a face more lined by pain than by age. The Countess has a round hoop in her lap, a piece of intricate needlework. My lady, says Celise. Celise, says Regina. I had wondered if you had quit my service. Please introduce us. Celise bows and introduces you. Regina inclines her head but makes no effort to rise. What brings you to me today, my friend? With many pauses, to word her story as diplomatically as possible... Solis shares the same suspicions with Regina that she had shared with you. As she speaks, a rail-thin man in a ruffled tunic slips into the room to stand silently at Regina's side. Yes, says Regina at length. Timothy told me much of this the day you disappeared, was it, Timothy? She offers one hand to the man in the ruffled shirt who helps her to her feet with perfect form. Yes, milady. I was not sure what to make of Miss Solis's suspicions, but I reported them dutifully. Regina crosses to her throne and sits with a sigh. She gestures to Timothy, Timothy and points to a writing desk against the wall. Timothy, the book in the drawer there. He goes and fetches a slim, leather-bound volume. This is Sonia's journal. I have not read it. There are things that a mother should not know about her daughter, I think. But you must do, my friends. I do not want to believe that my brother could stoop so, so to so reprehensible a crime as kinslaying. But I will not risk my children on my hope that Kirik is still the honorable man who stood aside for me when our father named me heir over him. She presses the book into your hand. You gain Sonia's journal, which is right here. So we'll take a look at that in a second. Mark story point P8. Okay, let's do that. P8. Okay. I suppose 
As if we were playing a detective game, we should mark when certain entries want a story point that we then get. So we would know where to come back. Uh, five, four, five, five, okay. Mark P8, we got her journal. So please read it. Perhaps it contains some clue as to Sonia's fate, and perhaps you might prevent Rochelle and Philip from falling prey to a similar doom. She waves a hand, and Timothy rushes forward to shepherd you from the room. Her ladyship tires easily these days, he says. Thank you. We will speak again. Celise frowns as she walks you to the door. So Timothy isn't the traitor after all. Or perhaps he's covering, or perhaps there is no traitor, just rotten luck. She shakes her head and opens the door. Read that book and make it a point to get to know the locals. I will call upon you again when you are needed. Time passes, the encounter is complete. Alright, so we need a time passes at Dragonholt Village. So morning has finished, now we're in the afternoon stage. You now possess Sony's journal. You may read and refer back to the journal at any time. Okay. Well, we've got her journal here. Uh, I don't understand why that woman, Celise, did not explain to us the mystery writing in her book. And her letter. All right, Sonia's journal. Well, it's a lot to read here. <clears throat> this is Sonia's journal, the journal of the daughter that died. Sunday, planting, 1850, with crossed off, that says 1851, Fairfax Manor. So he's gave me this book for New Year's Day and suggested that a young lady of my station should keep a journal. It seems a little that anyone would want to read my thoughts in days to come, but I suppose we'll give it a try. So New Year's on 1851. Sent me to an hiker, so all I do with it. Get mother to let Rochelle take a knighthood, a new mill or a new will, settle the Long Creek dispute with the Belmonts. I think it's time to breed Apple Dash. I know there's cat folk in the forest. I'm going to find them. Read at least 13 new books. So at least would insist find a cure for mother's illness. Okay. Sky Day, the fifth. I saw a catfolk woman in a red tunic run away from me. I don't want to scare them away entirely, so I didn't chase her for long. I've come to the tree to pray. I received a letter today from the physician in Greyhaven. He had nothing useful to say about mother's illness. Mother insisted all will be well, of course, and that when her time comes, she will die just as anyone else must, but she has barely 50 years. She is too young, and I'm not ready to be a countess. Rune day. I'm considering dangling Timothy out a window by his toes. If only we lived in a proper castle with a tall tower to do it from. The man spent nearly the candle harassing me about taking a husband. And what if I prefer a wife, Timothy? Did you consider that, I wonder? And producing an heir, I half wonder if he wanted the job himself. He's not wrong, of course, which is why I'm so angry with him. How dare he tell me true things I do not want to hear. Mother hasn't brought the matter up at all. She seems perfectly content for me to marry or not, as suits me. Bless her for that. I should visit with the villagers more often. I love my family, but they drive me crazy sometimes. I played a cutthroat game of cards with Ursula and Sapphire. They're so polite to one another. Forget that they're technically rivals in business. Good to learn from both these women. They see firsthand who comes into our village and have a better understanding of the flow of commerce through the county than the, even they know, I think. Also, I always eat very well when I visit. Gavin thinks he has found a likely mate for Appledash in the Cunningham stable. I'll have to see the beast myself, but I'm <coughs> glad he's taken a keen interest. Tending to the bloodlines of our horses makes me think about the county. I wonder about our goats. If we're doing all we can to keep those herds healthy, if they could be more productive. 
People seem happy. We breed our horses to be stronger. We can improve our county by bringing in new blood or new ideas at least as well. I'm grateful that with so many wanderer gnomes, orcs, and others in our village bringing their connections to the outside with them. Tulips blooming in the garden today. My heart is full. Galvin is quite correct. The Cunningham Stallion will do very well. Count Cunningham even turned down a stud fee. I think he's hopeful I might marry one of his sons. No, thank you. Albert Cunningham seems less than thrilled with the entire affair, possibly just with me. Philip and I spent today in the village. Philip set himself up in on the edge of the green with his charcoals and the scraps of paper he keeps filching from Solis, and I visited with Marquise, the village clerk, to go over possible sites for a new mill. The old one is too far outside the village. I think time has not been kind to it. Marquis is entirely in favor of a new mill, but has a host of reasons not to situate it anywhere I choose. He wants to go off on his brother's farm, from what I can tell, which means mother would have to buy that land back from him at a pretty price. I know the yeomanry are backbone of the realm and all that, but at times I wish we went back to the old days when nobles owned all the land. When I came back to check on Philip, he had that dwarf girl in his lap, doing her very best to draw an owl. Philip is such a sweet young man. Some days I wish he was going to inherit the county. He's certainly not going to be a knight like Rochelle. In the afternoon, I stopped by Fiora Bright Malls to see how Rochelle's new sword is coming along. I'm no judge of weapons, but she showed me that the blade is finished and now it just wants binding and mounting and all that. The blade looks lovely. Rochelle will be very pleased and surprised, I hope. She's talking about her brothers and sisters, I guess. Notes to myself, if I'm right, Apple Dash should come into season in early green tide. Make sure Galvin knows to send it to the Cunningham stable for studying. Rochelle's sword is ready, how to wrap it. Name day in less than a week. Sapphire says her niece is a good apothecary, good enough to cure and to cure mother. Ask Sapphire to send for her. I thought I had another note, but I forgot what it was. Okay, so she's hoping that the Mariam, the one we met, can cure her mother. This is my first time coming out for the blessing of the flock without mother. Everyone's doing their best to ignore it, but I can feel them wondering where she is. I want to cry, but a countess mustn't cry. The sheep are blessed. Rochelle loved her present name. They went well. I just heard that there is a new healer in Highcrest impressing everyone with her skill. She uses some sort of magic. I'm leaving immediately. I just realized that Apple Dash is in fact in her season, and I've ridden her straight away to the Cunningham Stallion. I'm regretting taking Deacon with me on this trip. Mother insisted I take a guard, but why did I choose the one who won't stop telling me about all his imaginary accomplishments? Just focus on the healer. This is all worth it if the healer is as good as they say. The healer promised to come visit Dragonholt immediately. I didn't even get around to offering her money. I tithed it here at the temple instead. Even Deacon can't ruin this mood. Strange man stopped me on the street and asked my name. Scar on his face. He seemed thoughtful when I left him there. Did we meet a Scar guy in the beginning? The healer spent an hour cloistered with mother in the shrine. She came out and shook her head and then sent me in to speak to my mother. Mother explained there is no healing what ails her. My time is coming. Everyone dies, Sonia, so I will die younger than most, but still older than many. I don't regret a single moment of life that brought you and your sister and brother into this world, so mother is at peace with her coming death, but I'm not, damn it, and I don't want to be. This isn't fair. Strange letter arrived today. At first I thought it was a suitor because the writer said I was as beautiful as the Eventide Forest, but the letter claims to be from my uncle Kirik, who I've never met before in my life. My uncle suggests I not tell my mother that he's written to me because there's no love lost between them. I imagine not. I don't believe Mother has ever said two words about here to me. I'm going to write him in High Christ if I want to know more. I believe I shall do so straight away. Apple Dash is back in season. I've returned from the Cunningham stable riding a horse Gavin chose for me. A bit of a wild one, but I do like his spirit. And what shall I find on my return but a letter from my uncle? But not a very nice letter. Kirik claims that Mother isn't the rightful Countess of Dragonhold. He is. According to him, Mother is his half-sister and bastard-born at that. It's 
So by the laws of the realm, Kirik should have inherited this county from my grandfather. Kirik says that he didn't want to press his claim by force and wage war against his own blood, so he went into exile when his sister stole the throne. But now that mother is dying, he asked me to back his claim instead of set aside for him. This must be a pack of lies, and I must speak to mother about this. I'm in no hurry to inherit the county, but I'm hardly going to place the lives of my people in the hands of a stranger. Not sure how to feel. A little drunk helps. Hunter is very handsome. So is his wife. Mother more or less confirmed Kirik's story! Exclamation point. She's my grandfather's bastard daughter and Kirik's older sister, but she claims that Lord Holland named her as her heir, as his heir, because when the county needed saving, she saved it, and Kirik did nothing. He abdicated his responsibilities, according to her. Kirik sees a county as a privilege, as something to own, but in truth, it's a duty, a job that is yours for the rest of your life. And if you fail on that task, people suffer and even die. Or words like that, a little drunk. Mother said that if she thought I'd be a bad countess, she'd pass the title on to someone else, but apparently she's certain I'll be a good one. I'm not so sure. It'd be easier to let Kirik take the throne and go run an inn somewhere. I think I'd like running an inn. I like working in the kitchen. I got into it with Celise today, talking about inheritance and lordship. If mother was going to pass over me for inheritance... If I were bad at the job, pass it to whom? Rochelle? Philip? Either would make a fine ruler of Dragonholt, I think. But what if they were as bad as me? Pretend me. Maybe the best person for the job is someone the peasants choose themselves. One of the innkeepers or the more successful farmers. They're used to making lots of decisions and leading large groups of people. So we said that what I was describing was called democracy. And it worked for some people in some parts of the world, but... Another couldn't just do that, but mother couldn't just do that because her choice of heir would need the support of not just the people of the county, but also the nobles of the barony and the baroness herself. And that meant it had to be someone of noble blood with at least a nominal claim to the title, so one of her children or Kirik. I talked the matter through with anyone who'd listened over the last few days. Timothy, Matilda, Galvin, Philip. Gavin thinks I should let Kirik have the place. I guess his father was one of Kirik's friends. Timothy reminded me that I should get married sooner rather than later. <coughs> Matilda claimed that it was all too much for a simple serving girl like her, which is her way of saying she wasn't listening. And Philip made fun of me. I think he was trying to cheer me up. I don't know what to do, but I have to decide, and then I have to stick to it. I wrote Kirik a letter, turning him down. Hopefully that's the last I'll hear concerning the matter. <laughs> yeah, right. Going for a long ride later, this new horse is still wild, but I'm learning. A week later, Kirik wrote me another letter. I think he was threatening me. I know Mother doesn't like asking men and women to fight and die for her, not after the two barons war. But it's really time we mustered a few more guards. The county can levy quite a few good archers and spears in times of war. But that's no substitute for actual men at arms and women in arms. Thank you, Rochelle. Maybe you can, we can attract a knight errant or two or create a knight household in Evermore or Carwin's Cross. Does our library have a name? The library? Dragonholt Library? I suppose it's the only public library in the county, so it doesn't precisely require one. I wrote to Kirik with yet another refusal. Then I found Solis and told her everything. She seemed concerned and said she had some friends she could ask for help. That's all. Awesome. Apple Dash is with foal, so I'm stuck with this new horse for the foreseeable future. Gavin assures me that it'll all be fine. Was Gavin the one that whose father's friend? something about how Gavin thinks I should let Kirik have the place. I guess his father was one of Kirik's friends. Oh. I need to take my mind off this nonsense. Philip and I are going riding today in Eventide Forest. Maybe I'll find the mythical Catfolk village, or maybe they really are just forest spirits. Timothy looked at me like I developed a bad smell when I mentioned my plans. and asked if I'd like to take one of the young men from Belmont or Cunningham families with me on one of these rides. What a pretty little man. Petty little man. 
Gavin offered to saddle my horse for me today. How nice. Usually he insists we all do it ourselves because if you can't saddle a horse, you surely can't ride her. All right, well, sure sounds like Gavin is a bad guy and a traitor, doesn't it? He saddled the horse right before she died. All right, well, it's evening. Some of the places we went to, like the bar here, Chetty Archer, is now open. And where is the, where is Gavin's family? Is it at the orchard? She wants to, she had the horse bred and she keeps saying that when the horse is in season, Cunningham Stallion, so Cunningham. And where are the Cunninghams? That's where Gavin is. Send it to the Cunningham stable. I wonder if that's what that is it. Where are my notes on this? Because C is his first letter. I don't see any Cunningham. Um, okay, where is Cunningham? Where is the Cunningham estate? Count Cunningham even turned down a stud fee. Where is Gavin? Make sure Gavin knows to send her to the Cunningham stable for studying. Is Gavin... Is Gavin work at the Fairfax Manor? Gavin thinks he found a likely mate for Apple Dash in the Cunningham stable. Is that the first we hear about Gavin? Yeah, well, I want to go back to the house. I, I think maybe Gavin works for us at the Fairfax Manor. Let's go back to the Fairfax Manor and see if now we're allowed to go in there. 1400. If four or less time has passed, otherwise the Manor House is not accepting visitors. Okay, so 1400 is, is closed. But what's not closed is the Chatty Archer. So let's go to 6500. Evening now. If four more time has passed, read the entry below that corresponds to the current day, which is the first day. You open the door and step into a warmly lit hall containing a smattering of oak tables and chairs. A long counter stretches the length of the left wall, bar stools in a row on one side, and a shelf holding bottles of varying shapes, sizes, and colors on the other. This is your first time visiting Watts Open. Read 8752. So we went 6501, which took us to 8752. Okay. A tall human man with broad shoulders stands behind the counter polishing a mug. His sleeves are rolled up, revealing muscular arms.
He looks up at the door as you enter and gives you a toothy grin and a friendly nod. You new to Dragon Holt? asks the man behind the counter. Well, I don't reckon I've seen you before. He gives his mug a once over and sets it on a lower shelf with others like it. Then he slings the drying cloth over his shoulder and steps toward you. The name is Hunter. I'm the owner of this here drinking hall. You introduce yourself and glance around the room before taking a seat. There are patrons at several of the tables, men and women enjoying food, drink, and banter. Others are sitting at the bar, engaged in conversation with a human woman behind the counter. Besides you sits an, early, an elderly human man whittling a small wooden duck. You look like the adventurous type. Me and my wife, Letty, Lay used to do some adventuring before settling down and opening this place. Hunter get gestures to the woman behind the counter. She smiles and waves. Lay can fix you up something to eat if you're peckish. Just shout at us if you need anything at all. Oh, no. oh ho, adventuring, eh? exclaims the older man sitting beside you. I and myself, many an adventure in my day, spent much of my youth making day trips to Eventide Forest. Though back then it wasn't as dangerous as it is now. The old man bows on his whittled duck, removing excess wood, wood shavings. So do you think this guy carved that bear we found in the forest with his thing? It says, if story point V6 is marked, if V6 is marked, that's going to be our whittled, oh no, wood trinket. V6 is marked. All right. So, therefore, we read 6622. Is that right? asks Hunter. Tell us about it, Theo. The tavern owner sets. sets a small bowl of nuts in front of you as the older man begins to tell a story about climbing trees in the forest. You can tell immediately this story will last some time. Hunter leans over the counter to whisper to you, Don't mind old Theodore. He just likes to tell his stories to anyone who will listen. Can't tell if he forgets he's already told the stories or if he just likes telling them again. But look, this is Theodore telling us the story. And... What did we find carved in a heart and the bear? A T and a U. So we can listen to his story or we can order something to eat by spending five gold. All right, well, let's listen to his story. Three, two, three, one. Can't wait to show him this bear we found. Three, two, three, one. Theodore goes off on a long, winding story about his youth, playing in the village and on the edge of Eventide Forest. The mill pond there, where the river flows out of the forest, was where we used to spend most of our time. We would catch frogs and then hide them where the girls would find them, just to watch them shriek. Theodore bursts out laughing, shaking his head. There was this one girl, though, Ursula. There's the, there's the U, T and U. She never let out. She never let our pranks frighten her. She gave us, she gave us as good as she got. Oh, I love that girl, but I never could tell her that. I used to write her letters and love poetry, but I could never give them to her. I took them to the Tree of Tales instead, out in the forest, and asked the spirits to bring us together. One time I gave her a little wooden badger I'd carved. Told her that it reminded me of her because she was fierce too. I don't think she liked that. Let that be a lesson to you. If you're going to compare a girl to an animal... She's something more majestic than a badger. But that was the closest I ever got to telling her how I felt. Theodore sighs. That reminds me of a story. So we can continue listening to him or show him the wooden trinket that you found if we have the wooden trinket, which we do. So 1390. All right, we're going to give him our, that trinket. Or at least show it to him. When you show Theodore the trinket you found in Eventide Forest, his story trails off and dies in his throat. My word, he says, taking it from you with trembling hands. He peers down at the wooden badger, seeming to see it more with his fingers than his watery eyes. This is the very one. I gave this to Ursula when we were both so very young. A smile spread slowly across his face. 
crinkling his wrinkles like a withered apple. It didn't have these letters carved into it then, though. T and U. Theodore and Ursula. You found this at the Tree of Tales? Hand trembling, he reaches inside his sawdust-covered woolen coat and withdraws a letter, stiff and dry and crinkling with age and sealed with a dollop of red wax. I think the spirit of the Tree of Tales is telling me that it's finally time. Why else would you bring this talisman into my hands? She must have carved in our initials and placed it there herself. He looks down at the letter, something on it, smoothing it on the countertop in front of him. Oh, but I still can't bear to face her. I feel like such a fool letting it go so long. He holds out the letter, his voice wavering. Do you think you might deliver this to her for me? She shouldn't be hard to find. She's run the Countess in since her husband died. You lose the wooden trinket. So we gave this to him. You gain the love letter, which is item C. Okay. You gain the love letter. You receive the sealed letter from theater. He asked you to deliver it to Ursula. Mark story point O three. Three. Mark one progress in heroism. Okay, so that was this sheet here. Heroism one. When eight has marked, you will each gain experience and fame. Okay. Time passes. All right. So a little bit of time passes in the village. That's up here. Okay. And this encounter is complete. All right. So we're supposed to bring this to the Countess Inn, which is here. And then we're done with this encounter. All right, let's go to the Countess Inn, 4200. Is it gonna be so simple? And no time passed, right? Let me just make sure no time passed. Oh, time does, oh, we did, and we, we marked it, okay. Um, 4,200. Countess Inn. A painted sign showing a woman's profile with a silver coronet adorns this two-story building. The ground floor is of pale red stone, while the upper story is a sprawling half-timber affair hanging over the entrance and supported by thick wooden posts. Flower boxes filled with colorful flowers are arranged between the support beams. If this is your first time, read 8742. Okay, 8742. The Countess Inn's common room is hung with old faded banners, most showing some variant of a black and white dragon crest. The coat of arms of the various rulers of Dragonholt going back generations. The far wall is painted with an expansive mural showing a large tree that you take to be the great oak at the heart of Eventide Forest, its bows enfolding the figure of a green-eyed woman wearing a silver coronet, presumably Countess Regina. The patrons in the common room are a collection of men and women of various races, all in their middle or later years, well-to-do judging from their clothing. They talk quietly in small groups or sit reading or napping by one of the two hearths on either side of the room. You find yourself matching their demeanor, walking more carefully, lowering your voice almost without meaning to. An elderly woman in a green dress, sits at a table directly beneath the painted tree and waves you over as soon as she catches your eye. Welcome to the Countess Inn, she says in a hushed tone. You must be new in the village. I'm Ursula. If there's anything you need, don't hesitate to ask me or my daughter. She motions toward a slender, almost ethereal woman in her middle years, carrying a tray through the common room. 
Pretty young thing, isn't she? The only one of my children left. The others have all moved away. If story point 03 is marked, which it is, that's the, that's the letter we got, then we can read 7276. All right, we're going to give her this love letter and see what happens. You offer the sealed envelope to Ursula, and she begins to smile as soon as she sees the handwriting on the outside. Oh, ladies' grace, she breathes. Theo, you damn fool, took you long enough. You lose the love letter. Okay, and it goes back. She breaks the seal and spreads the letter on the table before her. Candle, girl, candle, she says, and her willowy daughter brings a candle and a silver holder, placing it on the table to cast its light on the letter. Ursula reads carefully, tears beating in the corner of her eyes. Then she stands, presses the letter to her heart, and closes her eyes. I have something for you, she says, and steps through a door almost invisible under the mural's paint. A moment later, she returns, holding a time-worn cloth doll that she cradles with obvious affection. My mother made this doll for me when we first came to Dragonholt. I had no friends then, you see, and she told me the doll would keep me from being lonely. And it has, for all these long years. She reaches out and places the doll in your hands. Its colors are fading, but its stitches still hold true. Something about its crooked face seems welcoming. I don't need this anymore. I won't be lonely. I want you to have it. Maybe you can find some other poor lonely child in need, as you seem to be going about doing good deeds. We gain the cloth doll, which is item R. Okay. And we got the cloth doll. Like Raggedy Ann. Give, we're supposed to give it to someone who's need of luck and love. Okay. Mark story point K8. Okay. K8. Mark one progress in heroism. So we got another heroism. That's nice. She sighs and settles down again in her seat. I shall have to think about how to respond to Theo. Might be fitting to let him stew a week or two, but in the meantime, was there anything I could do for you? Can spend five gold to get something to eat, which might recover some stamina. I guess let's do it. Let's eat something for five gold. We've never done it before. Let's see what happens. Eight, eight, one, five. Ursula's daughter, whose name you still haven't managed to coax out of her, brings you a platter mounted high with lightly spiced boiled vegetables, red, rich red beans, and a cut of cold mutton. The food is a little on the bland side, but filling and seems appropriate to the clientele. So we recover two stamina, and time passes, and we spent five gold. Alright, so we got two stamina back, which puts us at 12, almost full power. And now we have, let's see, we keep track of gold here. So now we have 95 gold. Oh, and time passed. Okay. All right, so now we're finished with the Countess Inn, and that was the did we go? Yeah, that was the Chatty Archer we went. We met Theodore. He sent us to the Countess Inn. Um, we 
We can go back to the Swan for some more gossip. We could go check out Miriam at the Apothecary. Maybe she'll give us a spell or two. It's getting late. What's, uh... We can find out about Gavin. It might be important for us to, to deal with Gavin before it's too late. If we go to 1400, let's, let's go to 1400 and see if that's got some new stuff there. 1400, if entry point V6, which it is, because that's what we got when we heard the story from Solis. But I6 is not, and that's our situation. 4283, okay, so we went to 1400. And that takes us to 42.83. The serving girl, Matilda, comes to greet you. Miss Solis is tutoring young Lord Philip at the moment. I can show you to her if you wish. Please lead the way, or the encounter is complete. I don't really want to talk to Solis yet. I want to talk to Gavin. But I'm not... not properly understanding what Gavin is. Who Gavin is. She went to the She's finding cat folk at the tree. Um, Gavin thinks, oh. At Fairfax Manor. Okay, so she, Gavin is here. Gavin thinks he found a likely mate for Apple Dash in the Cunningham stable. Yeah, so Gavin is like the stable person at the manor. Alright, let's talk to Solis. Maybe we can tell her Gavin is bad. So 4283. Please lead the way. Let's interrupt while she was tutoring young Philip. So that's going to go to 3639. Matilda leads you up a spiral stair to the left and through a well appointed salon. You hear quiet voices through the double door at the back of the room. And Matilda knocks softly. Miss Solis, she says, you have some company. At a muffled call of, come in, the serving girl opens the door and steps aside to let you pass. Through the doors you find a somewhat chaotically decorated space. There's a pair of long writing desks under the windows. A long chaise and cushioned chair lie arranged beneath the bookcase filled more with oddments than books a fleshless deer skull, a large glimmering rock, a crudely fashioned wooden horse, a colorful assortment of feathers, books ranging from children's primers to classical poets, and a dozen other treasures of more sentimental than monetary value. An easel stands in one corner, its canvas a muddy mess of color. At a table near the center of the room sits Solis, rising to greet you, and a startled-looking young man you take to be Philip. Welcome, says Solis with a smile. May I introduce Philip, Regina's youngest child. Philip stands and bobs his head. How do you do? He has light brown skin, soft black hair, and green eyes set in a delicately featured face. He smiles shyly, then stands uncertain of what to do next. And Rochelle... The Countess's daughter and heir, says Solis, turning to indicate a young woman slumped in a chair by the window, a book across her lap. Rochelle, we have company. Please rise. Oh, says Rochelle, shooting to her feet. Hello, so good to meet you. She offers a stiff bow, 
then rolls her eyes and grabs hold of both edges of her dress to drop into a proper curtsy. She is both taller than her brother and broader in the shoulder, with curly brown hair, but she shares his same green eyes, light brown skin, and delicacy of face. I'm sorry, I bungled the curtsies again, Celise, didn't I? You did just fine, dear, says Celise. A curtsy or a bow is usually sufficient, no need for both. She turns to the serving girl and nods her head. Thank you, Matilda, that will be all. Mark, story point, I-6. Okay. <clears throat> we were just in the middle of our studies for the day, says Celise. Philip was explaining the Council of Barons and the rules surrounding its operation, and Rochelle was reading... Celise bends down and picks up the broad folio that Rochelle dropped in her haste. A fencing manual. Really, Rochelle? Rochelle grins and shrugs. You told me to improve my mind. Aren't you the one who told me battles are won as much with the mind as the body? Keep practicing that rhetoric, my dear. Perhaps one day it will be as fast as your sword. Philip steps towards you. Excuse me, you were with Celise at Nurikal, weren't you? Please, would you tell me the story? She keeps promising she will, but never does. You open your mouth, but before you can begin to speak, Celise cuts in. That's enough, Master Philip. It's time to resume your studies. Rochelle, you are plainly bored out of your wits. Please find someplace else to be before you distract your brother. Probably time for my daily practice anyway, Rochelle agrees, bowing to you again and stepping through the side door. Celise turns to you. My friends are always welcome to join our studies, of course, she says. So we can study with Philippe and Celise to read 8996, practice swordplay with Rochelle, or take our leave and time passes. I think my gameplay guess is that if we practice swordplay with Rochelle, maybe we'll get better at swordsmanship. But we already have the dueling skill, so I think we're going to study with Philip and Solis. So 8996. I'll put a little mark that maybe if we come back here we can do something else. 8996. Although, if practicing sword play got us athleticism, that would sure be nice. <clears throat> you join Philip and Solis at the table. As Philip explains to her the custom of the Dagon lords to rule through the council of barons, Solis asks clarifying questions and asks him to name his sources several times, sending him scrambling through a collection of books and loose papers on the table. In the event of a split vote, who decides the course of action? asks Solis. The council was formed with 13 words to prevent just such an occurrence, says Philip, pointing to a dog-eared copy of The Last Days of King Dakan. But... Ah, yes, but the 13th chair has been empty for centuries after the Night of Betrayal. So the barons can become tied, in which case, Philip pauses in thought, the steward of the citadel will be asked to vote. Are you asking me or telling me? You're reasonably certain that Solis knows the answers to all these questions, but watching her put Philip through his paces is an education in, its, in itself. Mark one progress in academic study. Okay, so if we had, let's see, where's our academic study here? Academic study one progress, and if six, we can learn alchemy, arcana, history, reasoning, runes, or survival. If we had done combat training with the woman, we could have, when we get six, get archery, brawling, dueling, or military. So good, we don't need that, but I would love, like physical training. That would let us get athleticism. 
Okay, and then, after some time, Rochelle walks back into the studio, now dressed in a fencer's doublet and a hose, flushed and breathing hard. Still at it, she asks. Time passes. And read 4765. So, 4765, and time passes. Ooh, we've got one more time passes, and then some event happens. Okay, four seven six five. That's enough for today, says Celise. Philip, good work today. Rochelle, thank you for indulging me earlier. You are still my tutor, says Rochelle, even if I'm not a child anymore. I'm not either, says Philip. Keep telling yourself that, Sprout, says Rochelle. Philip sticks his tongue out at his sister. She puts her thumb against her nose and blows a raspberry. For the moment, they both seem impossibly young. There's a pause, as if both children are thinking of something else. Then Philip bows to the room. I must take my leave. It was good to meet you, he says to you. Where are you headed, asks Rochelle, untying her doublet and following Philip out of the room. Shall I come with you? Talbot's already got the horses saddled, Shell. I don't need a wet nurse. Both siblings clatter down the stairs, and you find yourself alone with Celise. So, she says, tea? So we can join her for tea and snacks, or take our leave. I mean, I guess we're here. I might as well join her. I really want to ask her about that stupid coated leather letter, and I want to ask her about Gavin. So... I don't know why it's not letting me, but let's go to 5802 and see if while we're having tea and snacks and some cucumber sandwiches, whether we can ask her about her letter. Five eight oh two. You adjourn to the salon and sit enjoying the sun through the south windows. Celise rings a bell, and the raven-haired serving girl appears. Tea, please, Matilda. Thank you. You chat briefly about her young charges as you wait. Humans recover so fast, says Celise. I suppose they have to with lives so short. They miss their sister terribly, but life continues. Since my return, and thank you for that, I've, been, I've seen them smile and even heard them laugh from time to time. Matilda returns with the tray, including a silver tea service and a cluster of small flaky biscuits. Celise thanks her and dismisses her. You each recover one stamina. Okay, so now we're at 13, one away from our max. Every time we eat, it seems like we gain some stamina back. We can ask her, what has she been up to? What can you tell me about the Fairfax household? And what do you know about Kirik? All right, let's ask about the Fairfax household and see if we can hear about Gavin. So 3015, and I'm going to make a note that this one has some more options if we can come back to it. Fairfax household, 3015. Well, you've met Timothy, I assume. He's the steward. Bit of a mess, but he takes good care of Regina's estates. Phillips has his manservant, Talbot, and Rochelle, her lady's maid, Myra. Matilda brought us this lovely tea. Celise takes a sip and makes a face. This is adequate tea. And there's the cook, Sylvie, and her son. Macklin takes care of the gardens and grounds, and Gawain minds the horses with his assistant, and myself, of course. Celise takes another sip of her tea and sets it down. It might seem like a lot by elven standards, but I understand it's quite modest as humans go, even for such a small family as Regina's. You ask about Regina's family specifically, and Celise nods. I'm quite fine of Regina and her family. The Countess possesses wisdom far beyond her years, of course. She's not young by human standards. And the children have bright futures ahead of them, I think. At length, you finish your tea, and Celise stands and excuses herself, 
saying she has some correspondence to catch up on. The serving girl returns to escort you from the manor. Time passes and the encounter is complete. Okay. So time passes. That's our last check marks from here. When the eight time has passed in day one, read entry 3877. So this is the, going to be the end of day one. 3877. End day one. All right, let's see what this looks like, this event. You return to your room and turn in for the night, collapsing into sleep almost immediately. Your dreams are strange and unsettled, full of working threats and the shadows of wings falling across the land, cast by a roaring fire. You wake in the middle of the night, cross to your window, and look out across the sleeping village by moonlight. Eventually, you sleep again and dream of an endless forest and a plaintive voice calling for you. You each recover half of your maximum stamina. Well, we're already at one away from max, and we would now get seven, so we did not need that. But we're back at max now. You each refresh your activation token, irrelevant for a one-player game. This chapter of the story ends here. When you're ready to begin the next chapter, read entry 3432. So we will mark somewhere. Day 2, read 3, 4, 3, 2. Okay, and then it has a little note here. The end of each day marks the end of a chapter in the story. The end of a chapter is a great time to take a break. You might wish to stop playing for now and pick up from here at a later date. If so, record the entry number you have been directed to on the story tracking sheet so you can pick up where you left off the next time you play. Okay, so that was our second play session of the Legacy of Dragonhold. We went through one chapter in this book, in this book, and we know from this that there are seven days in the village. So it's actually, the campaign is significantly longer than I thought. If there's one session for each of these books. There's one and then two, three, four, five, six. And then seven in here makes a 13 session campaign. That's quite substantial. It still feels like a choose your own adventure book and in fact we're not even choosing adventures here so much as we're just getting some background story element while we're in Dragonhold Village. And it feels like we're pretty much on rails, but it is a very polished version of a choose your own path adventure book. The idea that the Village is some place we can choose to go to different places just to get a little more lore of the village. Whereas these books are more like action-packed quests. It's a pretty cool idea. And the checking of these story points has that flavor of that um, I'm sure Holmes Baker Street Irregulars used again just to make paragraphs so that when you're reading a paragraph, it will know whether you've read a certain bit of information or not, so it can direct you away or refer to it. And this map here of the village has a kind of Sherlock Holmes feel where we can pick any place to go to. And there's a little bit of mystery and clues going on with this journal having a little bit of clues about Gavin, the horse guy, and the clues in the letter. So, I'm intrigued. It still feels mechanical. It doesn't feel like it's really challenging our brain to figure anything out. And it kind of feels like we're on a slow ride. 
Um, so, but, you know, I've talked about this before with these games where you can't have a movie that's all action. There's a, you're, you're building up some slow tension, putting in the work to make you believe that these are real people and characters so that when something happens, you care. So I'm willing to keep putting in the time. I'm not completely enthralled with this world, but I'm willing to um, keep putting in the work to, to get familiar with these people so that I have an emotional investment and we'll see if there really are some emotional, psychological decisions to be made at some point. But there you have it. Episode 2 of The Legacy of Dragonholt. Our first day in Dragonholt Village. And I'll see you next time.